We're about to begin our broadcast, so we hope that everyone has a seat for the show. But first, here's a message from our sponsor, Procter & Gamble, and a message from ACS President, Dr. Diane Grobe-Smith. My name is Mridula Manohar, everyone calls me Dula. I work in research and development for Procter & Gamble, specifically in formulation for skincare. In skincare, we make skincare formulations, so typically they're lotions and creams, but we like to play with a lot of different forms. You can add color, you can add scent, um, and usually what we're doing is taking our cues from the consumers to find out what they want in their skincare products, what they should be doing for them. Is it solving problems for wrinkles, for tone, for spots, things like that? And then we give that to them in product forms. So that's where a lot of the chemistry and chemical understanding comes in to putting a product together to, to, to meet those goals for the consumer. A typical day is pretty atypical, so every day is different. I get to work around 8 and I get to see my office mates and I check my email, see what's going on in the lab, make some batches. Usually something goes wrong so then you have to figure out how to fix those batches. A lot of technical characterization, so understanding what's actually going on in your different formulas. Some days we get to do consumer research, so we get to hang out with consumers and have them tell us about our products, get to the heart of what they want from us. A day is not complete without some meetings, so there's always um, meetings to discuss projects, meetings to solve technical problems and challenges, to brainstorm, get ideas. I think the most surprising part is that you don't have to know everything when you start, and that there are a lot of people willing and able to help you, and that it takes a village, literally, to solve a problem. So it's actually a great environment to learn on the spot and problem solve. I work with a lot of smart people. They're also really, really fun, which makes coming to work every day really fun. They are exciting. They take problems head on and solve them and come up with very unique um, answers to different things. We've got great managers here and they are very close to the work. So they understand the work that you're doing. They've been there before. Um, they used to do that work. So they appreciate it and they know all of the stuff that you're going through. So that makes that relationship really easy. The best part of my job is how not monotonous it is. I get to work on multiple different projects, nothing gets stale, there's always a new problem to solve and a new technical challenge. Soon I'll be able to see products on the shelf that I've made and I'm really looking forward to that. Having to experience it and still not be tired of coming here every day really makes you feel good about what you do. Oh, nice. Hello, I'm Diane Grobe Schmidt, president of the American Chemical Society, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's ACS program in a box, Tales of Lab Safety, How to Avoid Rookie Mistakes. As president, it has been a priority of mine to focus on creating opportunities for younger chemists. As a former section head and senior scientist with the Procter & Gamble Company, I personally know ACS is a tremendous resource to help chemists build skills and keep current in a competitive marketplace. ACS is aware that today's early career chemists want more information, professional development, and more opportunities to network. Events like today's program in a box, co-produced by the Younger Chemists Committee and sponsored by the Procter & Gamble Company, serve to do just that. But it doesn't have to end today. I encourage you to take another step and get involved with YCC. You'll quickly learn that it is a valuable resource, providing opportunities to develop leadership skills and introducing you to a network of colleagues you'll stay connected with throughout your career. So use this opportunity to network with students, faculty, and fellow chemists here with you today. 
to chat with others tuning in from around the world and to learn how ACS can help you in your career. Then share your experience with us. Tweet with hashtag ACSPIB. Thank you everyone for being a part of ACS. Enjoy this unique event. Program in a Box, Tales of Lab Safety, How to Avoid Rookie Accidents. I'm David Harwell, Assistant Director of Industry Member Programs at the American Chemical Society, and I'll be your host this evening. Tonight, we'll be joined by uh, Jillian Kelmsley. Hi, everyone. Uh, so, we're, uh, Jillian, we're glad we're here. you're here. And um, uh, Jillian is a reporter with Chemical and Engineering News who focuses on science, technology, and safety. She's reported on many events relating to chemical safety and writes the CNEN Safety Zone blog. We're also joined by Mary Beth Mulcahy. Hi, everyone. So uh, we did hear from University of Colorado Boulder. So we have 30 people at University of Colorado Boulder. It's my I alma know. mater. Yeah, I know that's where you went. Uh, so that's great. We're glad. We're glad you're here. Uh, the, now uh, you're a chemical incident investigator at the Chemical Safety Board, and you, among other things, uh, you've investigated the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, uh, an explosion at a Slim Jim plant, and also a laboratory incident at Texas Tech University. Now, for you out there, there are three ways that you can get your questions to us. You can tweet them using the hashtag ACSPIB. You can also ask your group leader to enter the question in the GoToWebinar question window. And uh, your other alternative is to enter your question in the YouTube chat window. I would like to thank Dr. Diane Grove-Smith, the 2015 ACS president, for helping us to make tonight's event possible. And we'd also like to thank Procter & Gamble, which has provided financial sponsorship of this ACS program in a box presentation. Now we've sent over 200 boxes to assist with tonight's event to different local sections and student groups that are joining us from Canada, Europe, Puerto Rico, and all across the United States. If you haven't already, let us know a couple of things. We want to know where you're tuning in from and how many are in your group. Now, Chemical Engineering News is also making this fun by giving away one uh, digital camera, a digital SLR camera. And that will be given to the person with the best picture on uh, Twitter that's well, it has to be about an ACS PIB. It has to be about the event tonight. So uh, post your best picture uh, on Twitter using the hashtag ACS PIB to win. And make sure to check out CNENChemPix.org to see some amazing shots of chemistry in action. Now tonight, we're covering a very important and serious subject, uh, safety. And you're going to hear personal accounts and stories from our guests. You may even see a video with zombies in time for Halloween. Each of us is speaking on our own accord and not on behalf of our employers or the sponsors. The views expressed are ours and ours alone. Now the purpose of tonight is to communicate through tragedy and humor, the importance of safety because there's no reason that anyone else should be injured in the lab. Ultimately, we hope that we'll start a dialogue because the only way to change culture is through communications. Now, roll that zombie video. Student of three days, 14 hours, 12 minutes. 
You know, they tell you in high school how important it is to prepare for college so that you can survive freshman year. Shoot, I'm just trying to survive the first week. Hey, come here! Amy, this way! Come with me. Bring the cupcake. Hurry up. Hurry up. What is it? Hurry up. Hurry up. Hurry up. Access granted. Brace yourself. So get back. Ooh. Oh my gosh. Careful. It could be armed and dangerous. This is where it happened. The beginning of the end. What is this place? So wait, the zombie apocalypse started here, but why? I'll tell you why, freshman. Because the students ignored the five rules of lab safety. I'm lost. Lab safety is chapter one of the textbook. Yep. Lab safety is not in a textbook. Lab safety is in here. Help him. I don't really want to. Okay, lab safety rule number one, just for lab. Long pants, close toes, shoes, good, that. Not good, and this will never do. It's time for lab makeover. Welcome to the lab, boys and girls. Whoa. Lab safety rule number two, personal protective equipment. Safety glasses on. Proceed. One item of importance. Don't touch anything. Look out! Ah! Lab safety rule number three, always add your acid or base to the solvent, never the other way around. Hey Einstein, check your safety data sheets. That is cool. <sighs> Proceed. Rule number four, safety equipment. Here is the safety shower and eyewash station. Oops. Always know where your fire extinguisher is. You never know when it may come in handy. I like your style, freshman. Thank you, professor. That was hot. <laughs> You're on fire. Whoa! Ah! Ah! Thanks for hosing me off. Yeah, don't mention it. Let me know if I can return the favor. I got you covered. Okay, safety rule number five, lab behavior. Clean up your mess. Hey, and no eating in the lab. Uh, ah, going. Right. right now. Last dismiss. Oh, running. Always dispose and then run. Dispose and run. Now run. Run fast. This way. Watch your step.
now you know the truth. But there are other labs, other schools out there. They have to be warned. That's exactly right. We'll go with you, Professor. We, we know the five mm -hmm. rules now. I'm not leaving. But, Professor... It's up to you now. Both of you. Well, what will you do? Rule number five. I've got a mess to clean up. Spread the word. Professor! Watching the professor leave, I knew then what I had to do. The war had begun, and only Jack and I had the cure. The five rules the professor had taught us. This is Amy Shields, college freshman, three days, 18 hours, 12 minutes, and I'm still counting. If you're watching this, you are the resistance. Stay safe out there. And for freak's sake, follow the five rules of lab safety. Hi, my name is Mary Beth Mulcahy, and I work as a chemical incident investigator for a federal agency called the US Chemical Safety Board. And today I'm gonna to talk or introduce a little bit about the Chemical Safety Board, and then I'm gonna talk about lab safety from actually a more personal standpoint, um, rather than talking about one of the cases that I've investigated. So the Chemical Safety Board is an independent federal agency, which means that we don't report to EPA or OSHA, we actually report directly to Congress. And we're also a non-regulatory agency, which means that when we investigate an accident, we can't shut a company down, fine them, or put anybody in jail. The whole purpose of the agency is to prevent future chemical accidents. So what happens is when there is a chemical accident, we can be deployed to the scene. And when we get on site, we're interviewing people, we're collecting evidence, and we're trying to get at what caused an accident. Most of the time, people think about accidents being a technical failure. Um, it turns out finding out or determining what the technical failure is is actually relatively easy. And the more difficult part is trying to understand what were the human and the organizational factors that played into letting that technical failure happen. So once we've uh, finished our investigation, we write a report and we make our findings public, which is very important because without that part of the process, a lot of details of accidents wouldn't become public. Also in those reports, we offer recommendations and the agency looks for ways that it can improve safety in an organization or in an industry, or in the case of laboratory safety, we looked at how universities can improve laboratory safety. I started uh, working at the CSB just over six years ago, and when I look back at my pathway of how I came to be here, in some ways I wonder if I was actually fated to become a chemical incident investigator. During the summer of my first year at graduate school, I actually um, had a pretty serious lab accident, and it took me a long time before I was willing to talk publicly about this accident. And I'd say a lot of it because there's a lot of shame that actually happens around accidents. We feel like we've done something stupid. We feel like we've done something wrong. We should have known better. And there's a lot of conversation that goes on around it. And you hear those things. And my 26-year-old self has held on to a lot of that information for a long time. And I realized I was still holding on to it when uh, a few years ago, a friend of mine sent me an email. And the, the title of the email was LOL. And I open it up, and it's a screenshot of a Facebook post from somebody's Facebook page. And it was kind of jarring to see that 11 years after my laboratory accident, somebody was posting about it on Facebook. And so we can look at the post. And the first line of the post is, well, that explains the horrible traffic. Thank goodness I was on a bike. The person was referring to a news article about a laboratory accident. So you see somebody else post and they say, thank goodness you don't work at Amgen where the accident was. And then the next line is, that description sounds just like when that Mary Beth girl blew herself up in grad school. And the person responds, um, exactly what I was thinking, mix organic solvent with oxidizing agent, go boom. And then somebody's liked that post, which I don't fully understand what that means, but I find it interesting that they like hearing about a laboratory accident. And let me set the stage. It was a Saturday morning. For those of you who are graduate students or postdocs or maybe even undergrads, you know what it's like to work on a Saturday morning. You're trying to get a little bit of extra work in for the week. And I had gone to work. A lab mate of mine had been in the lab with me, but she had just left the lab. And I was completing a glass cleaning um, process or a procedure that I had been told about using by a more senior graduate student. Um, I believe I was wearing a lab coat on the day of the accident. I'm not sure about that. But what I do remember is that I had finished the cleaning procedure. And I had taken off my lab goggles because I thought I was done with the, the procedure. 
And um, I picked up the waste bottle where I had put my waste solvents, and I screwed a cap on it and set it up on the sink. And I clearly remember this. And then um, as I was stepping away, I heard a funny noise, and I continued to step away, and then there was an explosion. Now, when something explodes that you're not expecting to explode, here's what you probably won't do, or at least if you're me, you actually run past the safety shower, past the eye wash, and into the hallway where there's not much there that can help you. I don't know why, but that's exactly what happened with me. Um, luckily, there was a professor across the hallway who heard the explosion, and he came out into the hallway and immediately pushed me back into the lab and turned on the safety shower and held my face down in the eye wash, which was a good thing. Nitric acid was one of the solvents that I was working with, and nitric acid um, can definitely burn your skin. So I contacted Boulder Hospital, where I went, and I asked him for my medical records from the accident. And they sent them to me. So I've, I've got a couple excerpts from these records that I'd like to read to you. One of the accounts says, chief complaint, elbow laceration and left side laceration from exploding glass container, history of present illness. This 26-year-old graduate student was cleaning chemicals with ethanol and nitric acid. In a sealed glass bottle, it exploded. Sustaining the above-mentioned injuries to the left elbow and left flank, she denies other injuries, no facial trauma. The patient was treated with a brisk shower and irrigation at the scene, was transported by EMS after an IV was placed, and stable vital signs in route without further complaint other than localized pain. So it's not that simple. When it talks about the brisk shower, I, I'd like to describe that for you. Um, a brisk shower means that the fire department comes, and they have a... I think it was a kid-sized pool, and they have to take off your clothes, and they have a scrub brush, and they clean you or they decontaminate you with this brush. I remember it being painful because it was on my elbow that had been my side that or were lacerated. Um, there is some humor to the story. I also remember at one point looking over and seeing some guys from the program, and I said, hey, could you hold that you know, curtain up a little bit more so that um, they don't see me naked? And then you have to put on a Tyvek or at least I did, a Tyvek one-piece suit, um, which is not easy to put on when you're wet. Try that at home one day. So here's another description of that, uh, of them writing down what the injuries were that they saw when I came into the ER. Multiple five to nine millimeter reddened areas on her left forearm states, these are acid burns. Washed arms, face, eyes for 30 minutes prior to arrival with water. And a five inch diameter area reddened on the left side of her abdomen, and I actually can't read the rest. So while I was in the um, ER, they had to remove the glass, and then I had to go for a CAT scan to ensure that there was no glass left embedded in my abdomen. Luckily, the CAT scan came back that there was no foreign body seen in the abdomen. I also had x-rays taken of my elbow, and they found no evidence of um, fractures. So imagine if this explosion that caused this, that I still have scars for, um, what if I had been actually holding that bottle that exploded that day? Or what if I had been you know, a foot closer to it or standing right in front of it, where at a you know, sink level would have been right at my um, abdomen area? Um, so I feel very lucky. And I think the difference between a serious lab accident and a serious near miss um, can be inches. And I, I want you all to think about that. I also want you to think about what are you doing to ensure that this kind of accident doesn't happen to you? Because I'm not sure if everybody watching this video understands that there may not be anybody looking out for you, and that's the reality of laboratory safety today. Um, I just am leaving an ACS conference where you hear people talking about it, and this is a problem that I'm talking about from 14 years ago, 2001, yet people are still talking about the same problems. Obvious question, did I have training? Yes, I did have some training. I, I had a, a general EHS safety training um, that I had to take when I became a new graduate student. Um, another question might be, did I do a hazard analysis? And when I was in my lab notebook, I did find a page um, like the one that you see here, and I noted that I must have been writing down information that I assume was from what was then called the MSDS. Um, and I, I was writing down some information. But then when I actually looked at the procedure that I was doing on that day, I found it's, it's actually six, about six weeks prior to the date of the accident because when this exploded, it wasn't the first time I had done it. And when I look at that procedure, here's what it is. Um, it's really just two lines. I called it clean glassware. 
And I said, number one, we're going to use nitric acid, which I need to be concentrated nitric acid. Line two said nitric acid plus ethanol 50-50, which I knew to mean um, a 50-50 mixture. And then you see line three says and what it means is three rinses of acetone, three rinses of hexane. And I, I wrote three rinses of acetone, but I actually think I probably used another solvent. And then step four was overnight dry in the oven. I did not find any indication that I had looked at any MSDSs or safety data sheets to see what the potential incompatibilities of nitric acid and ethanol were. But the reality was a more senior graduate student had told me about the reaction, and she had learned it from a postdoc. And so um, I'm not sure that I thought I should look up anything about it, because the reaction had been happening, and I had success. And I wasn't using large quantities. Um, I think when I looked at the uh, medical records, I indicated less than 200 milliliters total of solvent. I remember walking down the hallway after the accident occurred, and I remember hearing somebody say, well, that was stupid. I never would have done that. You know, I, I have to tell you that right now, 14 years later, I look at this and I'm appalled. So I look back and I think to myself, I'm a little more forgiving of myself now than I was back then. But I think about what are the things that I could do now. If I was going to go back and talk about to my 26-year-old self what I would do, I'd probably check if it was a new reaction that somebody else told me about just because it comes from somebody else in the lab, I'd probably go talk to my professor about it. I know that he was surprised after the incident to find out that this had been occurring in the lab, and probably a little more, even more surprised to know that there was other waste in the lab of this exact same cleaning procedure. I also think I would tell myself to Google it. it is, there is a wealth of information out there. There's also books and other sites. There's a lot of people right now trying to pull information together to give people resources to look at it, because many of us who have worked in the lab have had similar experiences. And it, it stays with you, and you think about that later on. Go look into this, find out if you know, this is a possibility, or look at these other reactions that could happen. I know that after this accident, I was much more cautious. I, I talked to a lot of people. I was not afraid to ask the questions, because I knew the consequences if I didn't find out what those answers were. If you do have an accident, it's, it's not the end of the world. It will become a learning experience for you. But the question is, what do you do with that learning experience? Do you bottle it up and never talk to anybody about it? Or do you let your lab mates know what's happening? Do you let somebody else hear what your learning experience was so that hopefully somebody else won't make a similar mistake? So thank you all for listening to my laboratory accident experience today. Um, feel free, if you see me at an ACS meeting, come up, introduce yourself. Uh, you also can have my email address. Um, feel free to contact me, um, and we'll see you know, what kind of conversation we can have. Hi, everyone. My name is Jillian Kemsley. I'm a reporter with Chemical and Engineering News. CNEN is a weekly news magazine produced by the American Chemical Society, and we go out to all of the members of the society. I cover science and technology for CNEN, which means I cover science from materials and food science and pharmaceuticals to really basic nitty-gritty reaction mechanism stuff, and I also cover laboratory safety. So I'm going to be talking today about several incidents that I've covered over the last few years, what happened in those, as well as some of the common themes that I see among them. So to start off with, I'm going to talk about an incident that happened at the very end of 2008 at UCLA. This involved a researcher named Sherry Sanji. She was 23 years old, just a few months out of college. She was working in a lab at UCLA while she was applying to law school. The reaction she was doing, she was working with a reagent called terp-butyl lithium as part of a synthesis she was doing. Uh, terp-butyl lithium is a pyrophoric reagent. It ignites spontaneously when it comes into contact with air your anaerobic technique has to be pretty strict. And on the date of the incident, she was trying to transfer 160 milliliters of it, which is a very, very large amount for an academic lab. This is an excerpt from the Sigma Aldrich safety data sheet for terp-butyl lithium. I wanted to show this to give you an idea of what some of the safety information for things like this looks like. And if you look down at the hazard statements, they say highly flammable liquid and vapor, catches fire spontaneously if exposed to air, in contact with water releases flammable gases. So this is something you do really need to be very cautious around. This photo is courtesy of UC San Diego. It shows what good technique would involve with transferring terp-butyl lithium by syringe. You have your bottle clamped. You have an inert gas line, either nitrogen or argon, going into the bottle. 
you have your syringe with a needle on it that will reach all the way to the bottom of your reagent bottle. You have your bottle clamp so that you can control your syringe with both hands, and you use a syringe that's twice the volume of the amount that you want to transfer. So that gives you some extra room to work with to make sure you don't pull the plunger out of the syringe. Now this is for small transfers, uh, 10, maybe 15 milliliters. For more than that, most people would use a cannula or a double tip needle, and you'd put one end of the needle in your reagent bottle, put the other one into a graduated cylinder, and you'd slightly pressurize your reagent bottle to push the reagent into the graduated cylinder. So that's good technique. It's unclear whether anyone taught Sherry good technique. In fact, some of the evidence that we have about this indicates that she was taught very poor technique for how to handle this. What we know on the day of the incident is that she was transferring about 160 milliliters total. She was using a 60 milliliter plastic syringe, which looks like this. It's a pretty big syringe. We, she had a one and a half inch needle on the end of that syringe. That's too short to reach to the bottom of the reagent bottle. And there was an open flask of hexanes in the hood. She was wearing nitrile gloves, no lab coat, and we don't know about what eye protection she was wearing. So there's a lot we don't know about what happened. Best guess is that because the needle on the syringe was too short to reach to the bottom of the bottle, she's probably holding the reagent bottle upended in one hand, trying to syringe with the other. And I don't know if any of you have ever tried to use a 60 milliliter syringe, but they're pretty tight. This is not something you should be trying to do with one hand. Also, 160 mils total, she's probably trying to do three transfers of 50 to 55 milliliters in a 60 milliliter syringe. She didn't have that extra volume as a safety margin. We don't know what happened, um, whether just trying to manipulate the syringe, she pulled the plunger out and exposed the terpetal lithium to air, or whether some air got into the system, set the terpetal lithium on fire in the syringe and pushed the plunger out. But somehow the plunger came out the terpetal lithium caught fire, the open flask of hexanes in the hood caught fire, and Sherry's clothes caught on fire. There was a postdoc in the lab with her. He was not working with her, he was cleaning his lab bench. And this is his description of what happened. I was cleaning up my table and suddenly I heard a scream from Sherry. I turned around and then saw Sherry was on fire. I immediately used a white laboratory coat and wrapped it around her in an attempt to put out the fire. She was screaming and was moving around, and I was attempting to wrap her tightly. The bottom part of the lab coat got caught on fire, and I decided to throw it away. I then poured tap water on her in an attempt to put out the fire. There was a safety shower in the room. If there's one thing I would like all of you to take away from this is to practice your emergency response. When you're doing an experiment, think through not just what you're going to do, but what the worst possible outcome might be and how you're going to respond to that. Panicking when you're on fire is a perfectly normal response. You heard Mary Beth's story about how she panicked when the, the waste jar uh, exploded and she got nitric acid on her. If you've gone through that in your head and maybe walked through it, okay, I spill sulfuric acid on myself, the safety shower's there, this is where I go. If you've walked through that, you build some muscle memory and maybe that will help you respond if the worst should happen to you. Likewise, think about what you would do if your lab mate suddenly found themselves on fire or doused in something corrosive. The response to the incident, the California Division of Occupational Health and Safety investigated the incident and fined UCLA just shy of $32,000. They cited the university for lack of training, not wearing personal protective equipment, and not correcting unsafe work conditions in a timely manner. And that not correcting piece comes from the fact that there had been an EHS inspection of the lab earlier in the fall, that people had been cited for not wearing PPE, and then Sherry was not wearing appropriate PPE for her accident. The case then got forwarded to the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office. They filed felony charges of labor code violations against the university and the professor in charge of the lab, Patrick Heron. Eventually, there was a settlement related to the case where UC wound up standardizing general safety training, uh, assessing needs for PPE and just personal protective equipment and distributing that to researchers. That included lab coats, eye protection, um, gloves, uh, sometimes face masks, including flame-resistant lab coats for people who were working with large amounts of flammable materials. And they developed a bunch of standard operating procedures um, 
for handling hazardous chemicals. I will say here with regard to the general standardized general safety training, I don't know that general safety training would have made a big difference in this particular case. The techniques for handling tert-butyl lithium are too specialized. There are, you know, not all of the labs in the chemistry department are going to handle it. That's really more of a lab-specific training thing, as is, you know, recognizing what the specific risks are and emergency response for the reactions that you're doing. UCLA also standardized and expanded their safety inspections. And some of the photos that I've shown here are from a personal protective equipment distribution event at uh, the University of California, Santa Barbara. Moving on to an incident that Mary Beth mentioned, one at Texas Tech University. This involved a senior graduate student making nickel hydrazine perchlorate. That is a primary explosive. They knew they were making explosives. The lab had a research project for the Department of Homeland Security to characterize new explosive materials. If you try to look for a safety data sheet on nickel hydrazine perchlorate, you won't find one. And if you're ever in a situation like that, that's a big red flag. Um, there are safety data sheets for water and sand. Um, if you can't find chemical information, chemical hazard information on something, that's probably because no one's selling it and it's possibly because it's so dangerous, no one wants to make it. So if you ever can't find information on something, um, don't assume that's because it's innocuous. This particular student was working in a lab. Because they were working with explosives, the lab ostensibly had a limit of 100 micrograms. That was, they were supposed to synthesize no more than that at any one time. He was having trouble with uh, his analytical results in characterizing the material. And he thought that part of that might have been because he was synthesizing such small amounts and it, it was batch to batch inconsistency that were creating problems with the analytical data. So he scaled up. He thought, OK, if I do all of this on one batch, maybe I'll figure out what the problem is. But he went from 100 milligrams to 10 grams. He took half of that material. It was lumpy. He thought it was safe to grind when it was wet with a solvent. So he put it in a mortar, added some solvent, took a pestle, and started grinding it. In the middle of the lab, no fume hood, no blast shield, no personal protective equipment, and it blew up in his hands. He lost three fingers on one hand. He permanently damaged his eyes. At the time he did this, he was training a first-year graduate student and clearly training them to flaunt all of the safety rules that were in place. And others in the lab knew that he'd been scaling up. And despite what was a clear risk to themselves, um, you can see the damage that was done to the laboratory bench. It was very lucky no one else got hurt in this reaction. No one spoke up uh, to the PIs or to anyone else um, that he was doing this. As Mary Beth mentioned, the Chemical Safety Board investigated this incident. And you can go look up their report on their website. Some of the responses at Texas Tech included moving EHS from facilities to under the Vice Provost for Research to try to give them some more authority. Um, EHS became involved in hiring and lab renovations. I know a big issue for a lot of academic campuses is that you have desks in laboratories, and so making people wear protective equipment at their desks becomes kind of a contentious issue. Um, so now EHS at Texas Tech is trying to work with people uh, doing renovations or building laboratories to try to prevent some of that. Uh, they established a faculty chemical safety committee akin to their already existing biosafety committee. And they have included safety in their responsible conduct of research training that NIH and NSF require for some of their funds. An incident last year at the University of Minnesota involved a graduate student preparing azitotrimethylsilane from sodium azide at 200 gram scale. This is a synthesis that's been known for decades. It goes back to 1970. In this particular case, they were having trouble with the reagent clumping. And there was some indication from the literature that switching the solvent to polyethylene glycol would help solve that. But the challenge with azide is that in water or an acidic environment, you can form hydrozoic acid, which is explosive. So there's a concern here. You know, you have a scientific need you're trying to meet, stop this clumping. But you need to think about your solvent choice. Is that going to create a problem by substituting? Here's an excerpt from the NIOSH Pocket Guide to Chemical Hazards on Sodium Azide. And if you look down at the incompatibilities and reactivities, it says acids, metals, water. And again, that goes to that formation of hydrozoic acid concern. Here's from Chemical Book on Hydrozoic Acid. 
And if you look down at the properties, unstable, violently explosive in the concentrated or pure state. So what happened in this incident, they'd been running the reaction, the stirring stopped. That could have also been a source of an explosion if you heat azide, it can detonate. The researcher, his desk was in the lab, he was actually heading out to lunch. So he took off his PPE at his desk, he was walking out the door, he glances at his hood, realizes the stirring has stopped, and reaches into the hood to try to fix the problem. And at that point, the reaction detonated. And he was injured on his arm and on his side, and he needed surgery to remove the glass shards. So in response to this incident, um, if you talk to the University of Minnesota Chemistry Department Chair, he will say the most important thing he did was call a meeting of everyone in the department to talk about what had happened and what their responses were. And they had a 45-minute discussion um, that he thought was really helpful in terms of communicating to the department what went wrong and why the department was taking the actions in response that it was. Uh, the department has limited their azide reactions to five gram scale. They don't think they have any engineering controls capable of um, handling a detonation of more than that. Um, they assessed their standard operating procedures, tried to really think through what they were doing and how to do it safely. They've implemented what they call safe operation cards on the hoods, and these are small cards that they put up on the hoods that say who's running a reaction, how to contact them, what's involved in their reaction and the hazards and what the emergency response should be. And those lab groups in that department are also now supposed to hold monthly safety discussions. Finally, the last incident I'm gonna talk about is one that occurred earlier this year at UC Berkeley in March. This was a graduate student working with diazonium chemistry. Here's an example of a diazonium compound. He decided he wanted to look at counter ion effects on the reaction and one of the counter ions he chose was perchlorate. So you have a diazonium perchlorate this is from Bretherick's Handbook of Reactive Chemical Hazards on diazonium perchlorates, which says extremely explosive, shock-sensitive materials when dry, some even when damp. Most of the synthesis was done with the student wearing the appropriate personal protective equipment and taking the appropriate precautions. But his advisor says at the end he got complacent and he was scraping the compound out of a porcelain funnel using a metal spatula wearing only standard eyeglasses when it blew up in his hands. And this is the photo of what happened to his glasses. He had cuts on his face. He needed eye surgery, uh, but luckily for him, there was no permanent damage. So the response to this incident, um, the lab group now requires people to pull the GHS, the hazard classification numbers that are on SDSs, to write those in their notebooks when they're writing down their experiments. And they have to review the standard operating procedures for anything that has a code ending in zero or one. Those are the highest hazard compounds. Any work with perchlorates, they now need to explicitly discuss with the professor before they do the experiment. The College of Chemistry at UC Berkeley is now going to cover the cost of prescription eyewear for their researchers, um, anything above and beyond what insurance does, doesn't cover. The concern there is that when you have your regular eyeglasses on, you sort of feel like your eyes are protected. Although, as this incident shows, if they're not actually safety eyewear, they're not going to do much for you. And they are also considering, they have standard operating procedures in place, but one of the concerns they heard when they were talking with people afterward was that people join a group and they have to read and sign a whole bunch of SOPs, and they're long, and the information really isn't sticking. And so they're wondering if some sort of abstract or summary or highlights might make them a little more accessible to people and hopefully get them to read them again when they're doing chemistry that requires those procedures. So some of the common themes I see in all of this. Um, one is these are known hazards. Sometimes I hear people commenting about academic lab safety that we're doing research, we're doing new stuff, we don't know. But honestly, all of the incidents that I've heard about really do involve known risks. Um, and in this case, you know, terpetyl lithium, nickel hydrazine perchlorate, azide, these are all things that we know are highly hazardous. I added nitric acid waste on there, not just because that was what was involved with Mary Beth's incident, but because that is actually, I think, the most common incident that I hear about is people combining nitric acid and organics. Something else that seems to be coming up a lot is that people have a reasonable scientific justification for what they're doing experimentally. Um, my, solvent, my reaction's clumping, I'm gonna change the solvent to try to fix that. My analytical tests are kinda wonky, so I wanna scale up. 
and so I can do everything on one batch. But there's no risk assessment component to that. So if you're going to change what you're doing, you need to think about what are the possible consequences of this change. Another thing that I think is a problem is what I call training by telephone. And telephone's a game. I don't know if everyone calls it the same thing, but I played it in grade school as, as a gossip lesson where you'd sit in a circle and one person would whisper something to the person next to them, they would whisper it to the person next to them, and by the time you get all the way around the circle, the message is completely garbled. And when your lab-specific training program involves a professor training the first cohort of graduate students, which trains the next and trains the next, and they go off to train their people, you get a few generations down, and the technique may be completely garbled. Um, like I said, it's unclear what sort of training Sherry Sanji had received, but it's possible that a postdoc trained her to use poor technique. And finally, lack of personal protective equipment. Um, in all of these cases, there were problems with the PPE that people were not wearing, and they were not wearing appropriate equipment for what they were doing. At the same time, PPE is your last line of defense. So these other things, knowing your chemistry, knowing the risks, doing the risk assessment, being properly trained, all need to come before the personal protective equipment. Lastly, here's some resources. Um, I know not everyone gets the support that they really need in the lab. If you need chemical information, you can look to safety data sheets. Manufacturers are required to provide those for whatever they sell. NIOSH Pocket Guide to Chemical Hazards. Bretherick's Handbook of Reactive Chemical Hazards, that should be in your library. And then NIH ToxNet are all good resources for finding chemical information. Um, for videos and techniques, um, the Dow Labs, Lab Safety Academy is a very good resource. Um, for general safety practices in the lab, the National Academy's Prudent Practices in the Laboratory is freely available, as is the ACS document on identifying and evaluating hazards in research laboratories. The last one is really more for faculty. It's a textbook, Laboratory Safety for Chemistry Students, and it's designed to be modular um, so that it can be incorporated into different laboratory classes in whatever order you might need the information. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, well, we have several questions that have come in to us uh, while you're watching the videos. And so we want to start out with a question about why do these lab accidents keep happening? Well, I think it's important to remember that um, even if we have great training, even if we have um, great equipment, that the reality is people can always make a mistake. Um, we can become distracted. We can forget to do something. And so what we have to strive to do is how to reduce our risk as low as possible. Um, and that but we do that by having good uh, training, by having good risk analyses, by talking to each other, and by learning from the accidents that have happened previously. You said something earlier uh, while we were off the air, actually before we even started, and you were talking about being risk averse or... It, Help me out with that. There's a great quote, and I'm going to paraphrase it, and um, it won't be. It, it's Corey Fitzer, and uh, he made a comment about, do we want to be risk adverse, meaning we almost pretend that there is no risk. We don't want to talk about the risk, but that really makes us risk adverse. Or do we want to be risk competent? Do we tell people that we're leading them you know, into a dangerous situation, but to be aware of how we can make it as safe as possible? Okay, so when we're thinking about making things safe as possible, who's really responsible for that safety training? Well, I would say, you know, universities or, or other organizations do do general safety training, but um, there's a lot of training that really needs to be lab specific. You know, something like handling a pyrophoric reagent like tert butyl lithium, that's not something that all labs do. It's not something everyone needs to know. It's not something that is ever going to be covered in general lab safety training. That, then the responsibility really falls on the PIs to make sure that the people in their lab are trained and trained well. That goes back to the game of telephone and, and making sure there's some quality control in there to make sure that, that people do know what they're doing and they, that they, do, they are risk competent and you know, know how to keep themselves safe. Well, this is coming in from the University of Akron, and it's related. So what happens when uh, those uh, leaders in your lab, your PI, is unsafe? 
What if they ask you to do something that's unsafe? Well, I think to some degree you can mitigate that yourself by, you know, doing your own homework, you know, looking for safety resources, um, whether it's safety data sheets, whether it's NIH's ToxNet or PubChem or uh, actually something I forgot to mention earlier, uh, if you're lucky enough to have a science or a chemistry librarian, they are experts at tracking down information. So you can do some of that yourself. Um, but uh, Mary yeah, Beth, you, you wanted to. Chime you really in here. can't say um, strongly enough how the influence that leaders in the laboratory can have, whether that's the principal investigator, the head of the chemistry department. So, um, you know, the safety messages aren't just for the graduate students or the undergraduate students doing research. It's really about the leaders and what's the influence, what's the model that is being set from the top so that it, it trickles down the organization. Because we're, we're really talking about changing a culture, uh, the culture in, in research laboratories uh, to make them more safe. So that starts from the top down. It also starts with us. And if we're asked to do something that's unsafe, we have to be aware enough and we have to pause and think it through for just a minute, right? Well, and for us, those of us in the lab, it's more personal than that. The person who's going to get hurt is you, the, the person who's actually doing the, the, um, uh, the research. So at some point, um, sometimes we have to stand up for ourselves. It's not the ideal situation, but if you're in that situation, stand up for yourself. You're the one who's going to take the trip to the ER in an ambulance if something terrible happens. And there may be places you can go within a university, like I... I if I remember correctly, I was a graduate student at Stanford. There was an ombudsperson who you could go to. So if you're not comfortable going to your PI or the professor or the chair of the department or the dean, there may be some other resource for you to turn to, um, depending on what's available at your particular institution. Okay, this is a more specific question. It's coming in from Twitter. It's from Willen Piera. And what is the first correct action that you should take during a gas leak? Uh, that, it's a, it is a very specific question, and you can only answer it if you have know the details of the lab, laboratory where you're working. And really, the one of the most important things that you should take away, or I hope you take away from this webinar, is you need to think beforehand what could happen. Um, I mentioned in my presentation that even when you know, sometimes you still don't choose to do the right thing. And that's why it's so important, not just for you to discuss it, but to talk about it with your lab mates and your um, other people present in the laboratory so that there is somebody there who can help um, and that you're aware of what those mitigating controls or actions should be. It, it's such a specific question. I don't know what the gas is. I don't know if there's a, a stop you know, gas flow button. Um, it's hard to say exactly. But well, again, one of the things that you said before we started today was it's uh, was talking about when we have those discussions, right? And and it's important to have those discussions beforehand. It's imperative. Um, you you want to consider the fact cause, that you know because actually the laboratory accident you discussed with Sherry, she also didn't run right towards the lab safety. Um, shower. So we have to realize that sometimes those of us in the midst of an, um, an incident aren't going to make the right decision. Or what if we're affected in such a way that we're not conscious? So those conversations have to happen beforehand because you may not be of sound mind to actually take those actions afterwards. Did, did you have something to add? No, really just to emphasize that that's, you know, what is the first thing to do during a gas leak is really something you should know the answer to before you start your experiment to really think through what you're doing and what the emergency response is before you get started. It, something else that y'all talked about before we went on air um, was that uh, it's important to practice as well. It's not good enough to just talk, talk it through, but you need to, to actually put it in practice so that it feels right. It makes sense the day of or when the incident happens. Uh, this is coming in again from Twitter from Kristen uh, Golbo. Uh, no, Gublo. Sorry about that. Uh, Kristen Gublo. Uh, should ACS provide certification uh, for undergraduate degree programs? Uh, we offer a course here uh, and that certification is in safety. Um, we offer a course here at SUNY Oswego. There's a couple different attitudes toward whether or not a, a separate safety course is appropriate. Um, the approach that ACS has taken um, with its 
uh, is, it, with its undergraduate curriculum is that safety shouldn't be a separate class. It should be built into all of your other coursework um, so that safety becomes integral to the chemistry that you do in your lab work, not this other separate thing. Um, so the requirements are there for uh, ACS program, uh, ACS approved programs, um, but not as a separate class. So we have a question coming in uh, from also on Twitter from Robin Bright. So what happened to the UCLA professor? Uh, did they get fired? No, he did not. Um, so uh, as I mentioned in my talk, the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office filed felony charges against both uh, the university and the professor. Um, the professor, Patrick Heron, eventually settled those charges. Um, he had to do uh, mostly a lot of communi community service and also um, pay a fine that went to the burn center that treated Sherry Sanji. Um, UC, or U I think it was UC, I'm not sure if it was UCLA specifically, but I think it was the UC system overall paid all his legal bills and he is still a faculty member at UCLA. Okay, so we, we're almost to the last of our time, and I wanted to ask you each, if you could just tell us uh, what's, what's the take home message that you hope everybody gets today? Let's start with you, Jillian. You know, I think it, it comes down to what I said earlier, which is that you, you really need to think through what you're doing, uh, understand what the risks are, understand how to mitigate them, understand what the emergency response would be, should, you know, think through what is the worst thing that can happen here or what, or what are the worst several things that can happen here and know, you know, how you're going to respond or, or how your lab mate is going to respond in case you're incapacitated. But it's, it's really that preparation component to this and making sure that you have the knowledge that you need. Uh, I think for me it's, um, I really hope people start having these conversations, um, sharing their stories. Uh, the, the importance of continual learning cannot be overstated. Um, I don't think I'll ever have the same laboratory accident that I have again, but I'm hoping, having shared now, I'm um, going back and getting the medical records and letting you see firsthand what can happen. I hope this motivates you, if you've had a near miss, to talk about it with other people because you don't know what that, that difference is between a, a very serious incident um, and something that turns out to be, you know, you can walk away from it. Well, thanks to both of you uh, for joining us tonight uh, and sharing uh, some stories, uh, both from your personal life and uh, from things that you've, uh, incidents that you've investigated. Uh, we certainly appreciate it. We've been hearing from you online about how much you appreciate it, and we want to thank you for that. We want to thank all of you for joining us tonight as well. And um, there's some resources for you. So there are a lot more resources on how to stay safe and plan for your career in chemistry. A copy of these resources can be found in your box. Also, these resources will be listed on the ACS Program in a Box website. And remember to send your pictures using the hashtag ACSPIB on Twitter because one lucky person is going to win a Nikon digital SLR camera from CNN. And even if you don't win the grand prize, there are other prizes out there. So uh, send those pictures. We want to see them. Uh, also remember that feedback is what makes this event better every year. So group leaders, please make sure to collect all of the surveys following tonight's event. And you can send those surveys back to us in the provided envelopes. And lastly, group leaders, please fill out the quick online survey that will pop up as you exit GoToWebinar. And once again, we'd like to thank ACS President Diane Grobe-Smith for all that she has done. And we want to thank Procter & Gamble for their financial support of this program. There were other groups that have helped us with tonight's program, and we'd like to thank them uh, for all their contributions tonight ACS, uh, for the ACS Program in a Box uh, presentation. They're shown on your screen now, so thank them uh, as well for us. 
And don't forget about the two ACS uh, Program in a Box broadcasts that will be happening next year. Save the dates and look for future announcements. Thank you again for joining us. And on behalf of all of us here at the American Chemical Society and the ACS Younger Chemist Committee, have a good night. And we're going to leave you with a musical safety number from the NC Bio Network Group. Sing along if you know the words and have a safe night. Bye-bye. Be addressed, no food, no drink, and clean.